Hello, everybody. Um, I've had lots of questions lately about elementals, and I did my show on elementals about Rudolf Steiner. And today we have fantastic Tim White here to talk to us about elementals. And I just want to do a little plug for both of us. Tim writes for Hermes Risen, and this week he put up, he wrote an article on elementals. So once you've watched this, you can go and read it. I'll put a link in the box below um, to his article at Hermes Risen, along with all the other fantastic writers that are there and writings that we've done. So thank you, Tim, for coming along. Thank you for asking me. I would like to throw it straight into the deep end and say, what is an elemental? Well, um, there is no necessarily clear definition of precisely what these uh, spirits or entities are, but the way that I understand it is that they, the elementals are kingdoms below the mineral kingdom. Um, in the esoteric tradition, we talk about the mineral, uh, the plant, vegetable kingdom, the animal kingdom, the human kingdom, and then kingdoms beyond that. The elemental kingdoms are below the mineral kingdom in terms of their evolution. Uh, we have to understand that sometimes people talk about elementals and nature spirits and when I'm talking about them in this interview I shall use the term interchangeably because I understand them as being the same things. But they are absolutely vital in preserving and creating to some extent the world in which we live. Elementals and nature spirits operate in all the kingdoms of nature. They operate in the mineral kingdom. They operate particularly in the plant and vegetable kingdom, animals and humans. They're responsible for creating us as human beings, for preserving us as well. There is also another kingdom which is separate to the human kingdom, which we would call the Davic or the angelic kingdom. And this is a separate evolution from the human strand of evolution. Although some of the devas are, um, have been through the human kingdom and some have contact with it. Deva is a Sanskrit term, which means literally translated shining ones. So these two different kingdoms operate um, separately but they are connected and it's often described that the angelic or david kingdoms are the architects they conceive and design all these things and the nature spirits or the elementals are the builders who actually do the work so you would find for example those people who have a garden you have flowers in your garden you might get elementals who are responsible for the scent of the flower, for the color of the flower. You might get an elemental who's responsible for um, the overall flower itself. And then you might get a greater elemental who's responsible for a group of the same flowers. So essentially they're the builders. They're the ones who help to create and preserve and renew what goes on. Now, these are not physical entities in the way that we would understand them. They operate on the etheric and astral levels. The uh, devas, the higher kingdom, would operate on the mental and astral levels. So this is why people in the modern age tend not to understand them, because they can't readily be seen with the human eye, because they are beyond the physical spectrum that we can perceive with our very limited physical senses uh, but nevertheless they're absolutely vital in the past everybody recognized these things um, all cultures throughout history have recognized that there are such entities operating it's only in the modern era uh, from the middle of the 19th century onwards uh, with materialism and logic and rationality, so-called, that people have not been able to see these. And because we can't see them, we don't believe them anymore because we live in this absolutely materially bound world. 
<clears throat> nevertheless, they are extremely important and it's something that I think human beings have to reconnect with. And I think they have to reconnect with them because they may actually hold the key to some extent to our renewal and our survival. But how do people reconnect to them? Well, although we can't see them, um, they, for example, a nature spirit or elemental will have a permanent astral body. Let's remind ourselves what the astral world is. The astral world is a world which is almost like the blueprint for the physical world. Everything in the physical world has its astral counterpart. Um, so these are like the blueprints for what actually occurs and what manifests on the physical plane. There are some people who can see them, primitive people, supposedly primitive people, uh, were able to uh, commune with them, contact with them, and indeed work with them. And all the folklore, the legend and the myth of every culture that's ever existed on Earth has recognized these. And they go by numerous different names. In Hinduism alone, there are 330 million separate nature spirits or elementals. In, Britain's, we would, in Britain, we would call them elves, or pixies or fairies or numerous other names. They're often said to correspond to the four elements, air, earth, water, and fire. So the earth elementals would be called gnomes. The um, air elementals would be called sylphs. The fire elementals would be called salamanders. And the water elementals would be called undines. But every culture has got a different name for them. Other popular names which we're familiar with would be the trolls of Scandinavia, the leprechauns or little people of Ireland, and uh, the nixes. There are many, many, many different names for them. And often they're very local phenomena, so that they would vary even from geographical area to geographical area within the UK or any other particular country. But everything's got one, hasn't it? Like trees, the mountains, all the rivers. Yes, absolutely. And if you were to take, for example, the sea, the sea would have uh, lesser entities near the shore and then would have much larger presences which control larger parts of the sea. What's not clear is the precise relationship between the elementals and the devas. Uh, the devas are, tend to be presiding entities. So the devas would be controlling a planet, a country, uh, an institution even. There are said to be devas which preside over hospitals, places of healing. Uh, law courts, administration, uh, each city, each town has a deva, and one of their jobs is to transmit energy from the sun, which we call prana, and also to communicate more widely with other devas as well. Um, few people can see them, but certainly in the theosophical tradition, there have been a number of writers, notably uh, Jeffrey Hodson, who uh, was uh, a very prominent theosophist in the 20th century, died about 20 years ago at a, in his 90s. And he wrote many books about both angels and nature spirits, and he was able to observe them. He was able to actually describe them to artists who were then able to put them into some sort of pictorial form. And he describes how they operate in woodlands and in natural environments. But the problem, Debbie, is that the more we've become industrialized, the more that we've had ubiquitous electric lighting everywhere, the more we've become divorced from nature, the more that people have moved from country areas into towns and cities, the more divorced we have become from the natural world. And therefore, we tend not to see these things. I mean, if you start talking to non-spiritual people about fairies and everything, and they think that you're crazy. They think that you're in need of urgent psychiatric treatment because you're having visions and everything. Now, although most people can't perceive them directly, 
there are all sorts of signs. I mean, if you are suddenly attracted by the color of a flower or the scent of a flower or a breeze stirring through a field or something like that, because there are nature spirits and devas of the air, these are indirect signs that you are in touch with them. Anybody who's interested in the natural world who goes walking in the hills or through woods or anybody who loves their garden probably quite unconsciously is communing with these spirits uh, without actually knowing about it at all. One of the examples I often give is that if you take a beach, um, everybody likes to go to the beach and they think it's because they like to get a suntan or go swimming or something like that. And indeed that might be the reason. But there are other reasons too, and it's because a beach represents all the four elements. You've got obviously the earth element of the beach. You have uh, the water element of the sea. You have lots of uh, nice fresh air and you have the sun, which represents the, uh, the fire elements as well. So this is where they all come together. And um, this is why people are naturally drawn to these particular environments. But even in cities, they still exist, although obviously they're much more difficult to perceive in cities than uh, in the natural world. So people do commune with them and understand them to some extent, but not on the conscious level. And of course, as children, we read all these fairy stories. Every culture has got its stories that we tell children. And there's actually more truth in these stories than many people actually recognize. So embedded within the human psyche is an understanding of what these things are. And I do think that in the future, and a number of esoteric writers have alluded to this over the years, we shall start to reestablish a connection with these entities because they may be one of our best allies. Although in many traditions, they talk about some of these nature spirits as being very mischievous mm -hmm and playing tricks on humanity, and sometimes being quite hostile to coarse human vibrations. They may also be very angered by the fact that we've misused the natural world, we've polluted the waters and the skies, uh, put plastic in the oceans and done all sorts of other things to create a hostile environment for them. But in the future, I think we will increasingly communicate with them and actually start to work with them as allies and not just look on them as the, the primitive superstitions um, of our ancestors, so-called primitive superstitions of our ancestors, but look on them as real living parts of the world that we live in. Most people don't believe that at the moment, but I think this over the coming decades and centuries is destined to change, I guess. Do you think that's because they're going to uh, see them more or do you think it's because humanity might evolve enough to suddenly start seeing them with their spiritual eyes? Well, I think both because um, people are now being born, children are coming into incarnation who have uh, much greater sensitivity and sensibilities perhaps than my generation did. Um, they are, we are starting to develop um, etheric vision to be able to see those etheric realities let's remind ourselves what that is the etheric world is part of the physical spectrum but beyond we, at the moment we recognize solids liquids gases and maybe plasma the four etheric levels are even finer versions of that which we can't readily perceive with our eyes but then our eyes can only see less than one percent of the visible spectrum, the visible electromagnetic spectrum. So this idea of seeing is believing is, is a nonsense really, because we don't have the attuned sensibilities to do that. But I think people are being born now who are able to see these things much more readily as our ancestors were. And in fact, you can actually see etheric stuff. Um, if you're out on a bright sunny day, um, I'm speaking to you from Greece at the moment. We've had some rather nice days just lately. And if you stand with your back to the sun and look up at the blue sky, 
sometimes you get little wisps of almost like cigarette smoke. Um, and these are the coarsest level of the etheric spectrum. And sometimes we can just about see these. We can't see any great detail within them. But I think that this is part of human evolution, that we will start to be able to perceive these um, again in the future. And, and also, uh, if you go into any uh, mind, body, spirit bookshop, the shelves are crammed with books about angels, aren't they? I mean, th this is something that's become very, very popular over the last 20 or 30 years. I mean, we call them angels within the Christian tradition, but uh, they have numerous other names in, in other religions, in, in Hinduism, in Buddhism, and all sorts of other things as well. So I think that a small number of people are beginning to understand that they're there, they're real, they're not physical, they're not physical at all, and they don't come into physical manifestation. And also because they operate on the emotional and mental level, we will tend to see them as in terms that we understand at the moment. For example, in the Bible, uh, we talk about fiery chariots and that sort of thing and dragons, because that's the way that our ancestors thought. Today, there's a lot of interest in um, extraterrestrials. And some of these phenomena may indeed correspond to what people perceive as spaceships coming from, you know, planet Z or wherever they come from, or the Pleiades or any other destination. So we always see things in terms of our own conditioning, in terms of our own culture, and in terms of our own perception as well. Um, and the fact that angels are very, very powerful presences. In Christianity, there are said to be nine different um, classes of angels, uh, you know, angels, archangels, thrones, dominions, virtues, et cetera, et cetera, all of which have distinct roles. And the idea is that each person has a, a guardian angel, a protector, if you like. And this is a very common phenomenon as well. And this has a great deal of traction with people in the modern world, because certain people think that, well, materialism is OK as far as it goes, but it certainly doesn't explain everything. It only explains things um, on one particular level of reality. In order to understand these things, you have to accept that there are non-physical realms of reality. And many people, of course, don't accept that. Because yeah, it kind of helps their boat a bit, doesn't it? It makes them have to think about life themselves, their fat, everything. It makes you have to rethink things. But if you already come with this kind of idea and belief, you're more willing to look at different views and points and understand that there's other beings other than just us, whether it's aliens or fairies or whatever. Yeah, I mean, one of the things is that materialism relies very much on a you know, left brain logical activity and, and rationality, so-called. And this is, as, this is okay as far as it goes, but it's very, very limiting. What we are starting to develop as human beings is what in theosophy we call that sixth principle, the wisdom intuition principle. And again, people are coming into incarnation now who've got this in a much more developed way than we or our parents or our grandparents had. And they understand things on that intuitive level. And I guess this is where the connection is going to be made at some point, intuitively, rather than having to have things proved in a, in a logical, rational way and have scientific papers written about it and everything. People just understand and it bypasses almost, the intuition bypasses the intellect and many esoteric traditions talk about the fact that the intellect itself can actually be very, very limiting um, because it acts as a filter for much finer forms of direct information. You know, it's almost like a kind of gnosis, a Gnostic way of seeing things, a direct communication, not going through uh, the wheels and the cogs of uh, of uh, the left brain and the rational world that we so highly prized today and it's quite subtle as well isn't it the way they communicate with us is a very subtle way of talking to us or 
making themselves, making us aware of them. They're not standing there going, hello, I'm over here. You have to become attuned. You do, and you have to get into certain um, states. And obviously, if you don't believe that these things exist in the first place, then that is going to narrow your perception enormously because you're not going to perceive what you don't believe can be possible. You know, if you don't believe that there are fairies at the bottom of your garden, and if you believe that everybody who thinks that is bad, then no way are you going to be able to pick up on these things. The but certainly, mischievous ones will come in state. <laughs> well, indeed. And <laughs> the literature, particularly the um, literature from England, and when you read a lot of the old accounts, um, people would be walking down a dark country road at night and they would come across uh, some beautiful fairy creature who would invite them into some subterranean world where they would believe that they spend a night. They emerge the next morning and they find that a year, or in some cases, a hundred years have passed. But our ancestors in Britain and every other country recognized that they had healing abilities, that they were responsible for um, health, they were responsible for the crops and for our ancestors and indeed now, the vitality of the crops and the fact that the crops are good is an essential thing because without that people starve. And so they had this ability to bestow what we would say is, is good luck or fortune on people. Um, and for that reason, um, people understood what they were. Some of the, uh, these elementals, particularly the sylphs of the air, which are um, thought to be particularly attracted to things like music. So there are all kinds of different ways that people can um, understand these things. And they, they do play a part in our lives, whether we recognize it or not. Um, they may inspire people. Certainly the devas seem to have an inspiring influence. Um, the devas working with the nature spirits or elementals as well. So it's a world that we don't particularly understand in, in chapter and verse, but we understand the basic principles which are involved here. And sometimes we have to just take a leap of faith and say, okay, when I'm walking through that wood and I feel something, you know, going against my face or when I see clouds moving or the breeze amongst the leaves in the trees, you know, maybe it's not just what we think it is. Maybe that is an actual presence. And certainly if you spend any time in a, you know, a British woodland in spring or summer, so much kind of going on there. But there's no point in just moving on and and saying, oh, well, that's it. You have to sometimes sit down and really consciously try to commune with these things. I can't see them, but I can perceive them through my other senses. I can uh, get the feeling in my own little garden uh, in Yorkshire, um, where I have quite a few trees, small trees in pots, and you can actually get a sense of the presence of them there. And people will perceive them, as I say, said earlier on, through the sense of the flowers, the beauty of the colours. Um, so even people who live in the middle of the biggest city in the world, um, these things still operate there. Uh, and it's just a question of people deciding that they want to try and see these things. And there are lots of books which have been written uh, with very useful exercises about how to commune with these things and how to open your mind and do all sorts of other things so that you open yourselves up to the possibility of, of seeing them. Uh, I mean, interesting. Yeah. Sorry, say again? Like leaving them offerings. Like in olden days, people used to leave little cups of milk and, you know, a bit of bread out on the doorstep every night. <laughs> Absolutely. And in countries in the East, particularly Thailand, they have shrines everywhere where they leave bits of food and they light incense to them. And, you know, this is absolutely normal everyday life for uh, those people who are primarily Buddhists. And so it's, it's not a problem for them at all. Um, but we see it as somehow, you know, it's, it's kind of beneath our dignity to accept that there are such things. 
But interestingly, I, I grew up in a village in Yorkshire called Cottingley, which had one of the most uh, celebrated examples of fairies in the uh, 20th century. Two young girls uh, told their parents that they could see these spirits in the fields and the meadows near their house, and they took some pictures um, of these things. And uh, celebrated theosophists like Jeffrey Hodson and uh, Edward Gardner actually went up to investigate and the photographs were checked and people at Kodak who made the film and the people who made the camera said, oh yes, these are quite genuine. Well, in fact, they weren't. Um, years later when these uh, uh, young girls had become old women, they admitted that four out of five photographs that they'd taken uh, were faked and they just cut pictures out of a, a, a girl's book and stuck them against trees, but they insisted that the fifth picture was genuine. When Hodson and others went up there, he could actually see these things. And the reason the girls said that they faked these pictures was because they wanted to show people what they actually saw. So although they admitted that the pictures were faked, they didn't admit that the experiences that they'd undergone themselves were faked. And they were simply trying to communicate this to um, a wider world. But obviously during the 20th century, our divergence from nature and our divorce from the natural world has become even greater. and We've become more fractured from, from these realities. Didn't they also say that it was really difficult to get the fairies to stay still? So when they were taking pictures, they were coming out all blurred. I, I vaguely remember something like that was happening, which was also why they had to fake them, because, yeah, they, they just weren't getting clear, nice pictures. <laughs> well, because they're not seeing them on, the, on the, you know, what those girls were seeing um, uh, wasn't a physical reality. And, you know, if, if something's operating on the astral plane, then it's naturally coloured, because the, the, the astral world is a world of of desire and emotion. And so these things are colored by our own uh, emotions and, and desires. One of the really interesting things is, um, you know, during the early part of the, um, the 19th century, uh, just as the industrial revolution was kicking in when people were moving in increasing numbers off the land and into cities and towns to work in factories, when they did see these nature spirits, they were often clothed um, in the, the type of clothing which would have been seen 200 years prior to that. So in Elizabethan times, they had you know, knee breeches and, and pointed hats and all sorts of other things. And, and this is a really interesting phenomenon as well, but people will see them, as I said earlier on, in terms of their own uh, perceptions in terms of their own belief systems because they are subjective rather than objective. We see them as we see ourselves. We see them uh, in terms of our own perception, not in terms of how they objectively are because they don't exist objectively in that sense. With what's going on at the moment, like there's the possibility of World War Three coming, would elementals be involved in that? Are there elementals that would try and uh, you know, ride along with the war chariots as, as such. Well, it's an interesting thought, but uh, certainly if we if we look at um, some of the research which has been done into extraterrestrials, and this is something that's interested me for a great many years. And I was watching a documentary the other day, and there are numerous examples, some of which have been filmed, where elementals and or devas have actually interfered with nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. It's quite interesting that the first, the most celebrated um, extraterrestrial encounter, Roswell in 1947, occurred within a very few miles of the Roswell Air Force Base, which at that time was the only place in the world which had nuclear weapons. I've I've seen the atomic bomb they were going to test there, weren't they, first off? Well, that's where they were storing them once they, mm. once they had used them on Japan. This, this was where the only stockpile of nuclear weapons was. And there are many cases of, um, uh, certainly with the, with the Russians and the Americans, of them actually interfering 
with these missiles. And there, there are films of things actually, when they were testing missiles, um, that there are pictures of these things actually floating around the warheads and everything. They've also said to have uh, activated or alternatively deactivated control rooms where these things are managed from as well. So whether these extraterrestrials are from another planet or whether they are part of the David Kingdom or the, the elemental kingdoms, I don't know. But clearly, from that point of view, someone is trying to protect humanity from destroying itself with these terrible weapons. Or protecting the Earth. <laughs> or protecting the earth and um, obviously during the 1950s and 1960s we carried out hundreds and hundreds of um, atmospheric tests with these weapons which must have uh, uh, created um, a terrible atmosphere not only for us but for them as well in terms of the, of the pollution and, and the radioactivity which uh, which was involved so you can see why some of these kingdoms <coughs> might <coughs> might be quite hostile to human activity because they will see us as being irresponsible guardians of, uh, of this earth. No, I totally agree with you. I, I was looking into the idea that the elementals or whatever we want to call them were rather annoyed that we'd split the atom because it created ripples in all the other worlds, which I know a lot of people don't understand. They think I mean the universe, but I mean like you say, the astral world, the epic, the etheric world, the ephemeral world and such like, splitting the atom had a ripple effect. So they're not happy with us for doing that. Well, they're not happy um, with, with human beings for all sorts of reasons. They don't like um, a lot of our um, coarse emotions, particularly, you know, our anger and the violence that human beings have a capacity to show. And you know, the events of today as uh, Russia invades Ukraine is just another, the latest example of human capacity for violence, you know, in order to further our own ends. And this is a complete variance with this world, which is about harmony, which is about balance, which is about love, and which is about trust, and which is about many emotions which human beings are increasingly becoming divorced from. You know, we, it's, it's almost as if, um, you know, violence has become the, uh, you know, the classic factory setting for solving all disputes in this world. And this is something which will further divorce us from these natural worlds. Because these natural worlds will exist even if we destroy ourselves as human beings, um, they will still exist. Uh, these kingdoms will still exist. And uh, the sooner we start to recognize um, that they exist without having to identify them in test tubes and that sort of thing, then, um, or large atom smashers and the large Hadron Collider and that sort of thing, we're not necessarily going to find them there, although indeed they, they may be there. Well, I'd like to thank you, Tim, and I'm going to ask if you want to open up your spiritual eyes and go out into the to nature and go and uh, try and contact the elementals. Tim, if people are interested in your books, what's the website to, because you've pulled a new book out recently, you've got a, quite a few others. Where's the best place for them to get your books? Yeah, they can um, find my books, um, Cycles of Eternity, which is basically an outline of the main ideas in the esoteric and uh, theosophical tradition. And my latest book, which is called everyone's book of the dead at uh, firewheelbooks.co.uk well thank you everybody for listening and thank you very much tim for this fantastic show bless you and all the elementals that are watching too <laughs> thank you very much debbie good to talk to you well i'm going to oh, try and press stop